All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Jesus died and rose so that he can pick us up from the grave. So that he can change our eternal destiny. And you can be saved today by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you'll place your faith in him, his finished work on the cross, his death and his resurrection from the dead. Word. 
perfect Savior, Savior. the blood that washed us white, the God, the God who was and who was, is and, and is. shall be forevermore. In reverence of the Lord this morning, if you oh, can stand with us, praise with us this morning. Praise with us. I'd like to invite you to go ahead and take your Bible and uh, be turning over to the book of 1 Corinthians, <clears throat> chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. And as you're finding your way there, let me go ahead and invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning. Because I want us to read our text right from the outset, beginning 
in verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which, is, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That was a euphemism, for some had died. Verse 7, and after that he was seen, by, seen of James and then all of the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, Paul speaking there, all as of one born out of due time. Then skip down to verse 13, would you? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Father, what words the Apostle Paul penned to that parchment all those years ago, Father, right at 2000 now. And God, we, we rejoice that the argument that Paul makes is one for argument's sake only. And that is that indeed Christ has risen. But Father, I pray this morning that you will drive that point home to us, Lord, and that we will also realize that there is a resurrect effect. And that is that Jesus is seated on the throne. He's coming again. We all have an appointment with him. And Lord, I pray that everybody will be ready for that appointment before they leave today. As Lord, those without Christ, I pray, will surrender their life to him and to be born again. Father, we trust this morning, Lord, that your spirit will move in us and through us and among us. And draw people to salvation and encourage the saints this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can be seated. Here's the question that I want to propose this morning. What if Jesus did not rise from the dead? What if his remains are still encased in a cold, dark tomb somewhere in Jerusalem? What if the grave was actually able to keep that which it claimed when the Son of God died? What if there is no risen Messiah seated right now at the right hand of God? Would this matter? Would it really change anything? Would Christianity at that point offer anything more than Hinduism, Buddhism, or Islam? Is the resurrection a take-it-or-leave-it doctrine? Some liberals have proposed that a resurrected Christ is nice but not necessary. My only response to that is, what saith the Scriptures? And the Scriptures clearly teach that the resurrection is the essential truth of Christianity. It is a non-negotiable of the faith. There can be no compromise here. 
there must be uniformity in our subscription to the truth of the risen Christ. The title for the message this morning is The Resurrect Effect. The resurrection has and does and will always make an effect. To make his case of the effect of the resurrection, the Apostle Paul uses reverse engineering. In other words, the way he presents the positive and eternal effect of the resurrection is to look at what the effect would be if Jesus had not been resurrected. So that's the angle I want us to take this morning. I want to share with you for these next few moments what it would be like if Jesus had not risen from the dead. The tragedy if there be no resurrection. Here's the first tragedy. Number one, that would mean then that Christ is lifeless. Verse number 13, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. No resurrection means that Jesus is still in the grave. It means that he is dead. Now you need to let that sink in for just a moment. How dark and how dreadful the world instantly becomes if Jesus is still in the tomb. Think about a dead Jesus in terms of worship, what we've been doing here this morning. I mean, a dead Jesus. Does that make anybody here this morning want to sing and shout and engage? Muhammad died at Medina in June of 632 at the age of 61 years old. His tomb is visited every year by tens upon thousands of of Muslims. However, they come to mourn his death, not to celebrate his resurrection. You see, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ daily. There's one day set aside on the Christian calendar that we know is Easter, Resurrection Day, that we purposely, intentionally come with zeal in our hearts to exalt Christ as the resurrected one. But the reality is we celebrate that every day, 365 uh, year-round, all the time, down through the ages. You see, every time that we celebrate baptism, buried with Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the Lord's Supper, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim his death till he comes. If he's not risen from the dead, church, he ain't coming. Amen? How about prayer? I mean, who do you turn to, to? Why pray at all? I mean, what's the point? A dead man doesn't hear. A dead man doesn't answer. How about service? Can you serve a dead man? How discouraging would that be? Where's the motivation? A dead Messiah is of no benefit to anybody. He just simply feels the hollowness of the grave as a victim just like every other person that dies. Without a resurrection, Christ is lifeless. Number two, without a resurrection, preaching is meaningless. Verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain. Apart from the resurrection of Christ... Why, I'm unemployed. Preaching would be completely meaningless. The word there is the word vain, kinos. In the Greek, it means empty or pointless. Without the resurrection, my voice is nothing more than the echo of vanity. Void of a resurrection, every speech, if you want to call it that, that I make is nothing more than the speech of the politician, nothing more than the speech of the philosopher, nothing more than the speech of the philanthropist, and nothing more than the speech of the professor. In verses 3 and 4, Paul states that the backbone of the gospel message is the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on our behalf. That would mean then that Jesus did not conquer sin, did not conquer death, and did not conquer hell. And those three great evils would be man's conquerors not only today, but forever and ever. I was um, watching 
one of these documentary shows some time ago, probably several years ago, you know, one of these like Dateline or, or 2020 or something like that, and they were talking or they were, they were running a story on how people wanted pets, but they didn't always want everything that came along with the pets, and some dog owners did not want the incessant barking of dogs. So there was a procedure where they would go in there and they would, you know, disable the essentially, I guess, the larynx of the dog so that the dog could no longer make verbal sounds. And so it would show those dogs just, but there's nothing coming out, right? They think they're barking. All these dogs probably think they have hearing issues, but it's actually that they've had something disabled on the inside. Well, listen to me. Apart from the resurrection, that's all I am. If, if without the resurrection, this is me. I have no voice. Now, I know y'all like that version of me a lot better, right? It's a lot quieter. It's a little bit more bearable. But you see, apart from a resurrected Christ, not only is Christ lifeless, but I'm telling you, preaching would be meaningless. Thirdly, faith would be pointless. Beginning in verse 14, there he says, And Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain. And look at this. And your faith is also vain. And then he tags it with this in verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. And get this. Ye are yet in your sins. The same word used to describe preaching is used here again to describe our basic faith in Christ. If he's not risen, it's the same word here. He says it's empty or vain. It means fruitless, void of effect, no purpose. Verse 17 then takes it a step farther and says, Without the resurrected Christ, we all are still in our sins. Romans 4, 24 and 25 says it like this. Like this. It says that God raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. The Bible connects, you see, Jesus being raised from the dead with the justification of sinners, that is, sinners being made right with God through Jesus Christ. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then his death was just the death of a localized revolutionary. It would prove that he's not the Son of God and not an adequate sacrifice for sin. Minus the resurrection, you see, believers are no better off in this world or the next one than are unbelievers. With no resurrection, believing in Jesus would be no different than believing in George Washington, Alexander the Great, Winston Churchill, or some other prolific person or historical figure. It would be nothing more than believing that a man lived and died for a cause that he believed in and our sins would still be counted against us without Christ risen from the dead. Listen, Christ is lifeless, preaching is meaningless, and faith is pointless. Number four, without a resurrection, witnessing is truthless. Paul says in verse 15, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised up, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. In other words, what He's saying there is all who witness to Christ as the risen Lord are not telling the truth. If indeed Jesus did not rise from the dead, the essential truth of the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, for some of those in liberal circles who claim to be Christian, but do not subscribe to the resurrection, let me go ahead and let you know that's not even possible. Because in Romans chapter 10 verse 9, the Bible says we must believe that God has raised him from the dead, and then we shall be saved. But some of those that want to deny literal bodily resurrection need to think about the logical conclusion. And when I say liberal, I'm not talking about secular liberalists. I'm talking about religion liberalists. People in some seminaries and some walks of the Christian life that deny the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. They need to think this through, the logical conclusion. So, that means if that's what they're saying, then they call Paul and Peter and all of the early apostles liars because they regularly witness to the literal resurrection of Jesus. Furthermore, 
You call Jesus himself a liar as he predicted his own resurrection. All of these people, including Jesus, would not simply be mistaken. They would be willful liars and therefore sinners. Additionally, if the apostles and the prophets and the New Testament writers lied about the resurrection, which is the heart of the gospel, why should they be believed about anything else for that matter? All Bible truth, listen, all Bible truth stands or falls on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Think about it. Jesus is the perfect Son of God. He is without sin. If there is no resurrection, guess what? He's a liar, and he's played a cruel trick on us by having us to witness to something that never happened. And if he's a liar and therefore a sinner, then he was not an adequate sacrifice for our sin. And so just like Paul says, we are therefore in our sins now and forever if Christ has not risen from the dead. Number five, grief. Without a resurrection, grief is endless. Verse 18, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Or perish. The phrase or the word perish there is, is a fixed state of being. They are perished with no opportunity to not be perished anymore. Every Old Testament saint, every New Testament believer, if Christ has not risen from the dead, has died and is eternally perished. If Jesus did not conquer the grave, then everyone who has died since Paul wrote this, including Paul himself, Augustine, Luther, and D.L. Moody, and Jonathan Edwards, and W.A. Criswell, and Adrian Rogers, and your loved one who said that they knew Christ, they have all perished in the grave, never to be seen or heard from again, apart from a resurrected Jesus. And i got to tell you, dear friends, you all know what I'm about to tell you is true. Funerals are difficult for us even knowing that Jesus is alive. Funerals are already hard, even for those that have hope that those who were born again will live again. But imagine funerals if Jesus is not risen. Amen? Imagine that. That would be unbearable. Unbearable. Trust me, I've had to preach a few of these over the years where the deceased had no testimony of knowing Jesus Christ whatsoever, and I had absolutely no hope to offer either the person in the casket or the family members that loved he or she, no hope to offer them for eternity, no hope to offer them for the future, because here lies so-and-so, and and they're going to lie here forever until judgment. You see, there's no prospect for them coming out of the grave. That coffin, that vault becomes a permanent seal of their fate. And I just got to tell you, grief would be absolutely endless and we would all live in eternal fear of death were it not for the resurrected Christ. Number six, I want to show you that based on the first five, life would be hopeless. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, indeed, in this life we only have hope in Christ. Amen? Paul, still building on his supposed argument, is saying, if we have hope in a Christ that did not rise from the dead, then life would be miserable. If we just simply go through life believing in Jesus but do not believe that he offers anything beyond the grave, then life is hopeless. And I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. I don't even really want to go on if that's the case. Life is not worth living at that point. Jesus is not worth serving and faith is not worth having if he's not the resurrected Lord. Folks, this right here is how bleak it would be if Jesus had not come out of the grave but thank God that he did death could not hold him and the grave could not keep him before he is the resurrection and the life thank God that there is a resurrect effect amen 
And I'm so glad that we can with joy in our hearts sing, Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Lord. But up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. He lives forever and ever with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Before the Spaniards discovered the new world, Spanish coins were, were minted and carried with them a picture of Hercules at the Straits of Gibraltar. And there was an inscription on that, inscription on that coin that read in Latin, ne plus ultra, meaning there is nothing beyond. But after the voyage of Columbus and new discoveries of new worlds were made, the inscription on those coins were changed to plus ultra, which just simply means something beyond. And plus ultra is the message of the empty tomb. There is something beyond. This is not all that there is because Christ is not lifeless. Preaching is not meaningless. Faith is not pointless. Witnessing is not truthless. Grief is not endless. And thank God, life is not hopeless because, listen, 2,000 years ago on a Sunday morning, the tomb would shake and the soldiers would rattle and that stone would roll away and Jesus would step out alive and well. Jesus has conquered the grave. There's um, a well-known story about a, about a German pastor named Pastor Schutz. He pastored during the Second World War, and the, the Nazi leaders had already taken note of him. And this particular pastor was attending one of the giant rallies that Hitler and his cronies were so skilled in staging. The speaker that day was railing against Jews in particular, and the audience was responding with mounting hysteria as they railed on them. Then the speaker spotted Pastor shoots there among the crowd somewhat down close to the stage. And he pointed at him and he said, Sir, you are a fool. He said, Fancy believing in a crucified dead Jew. And Pastor shoots jumped to his feet and shouted, Yes, sir. He said, I should indeed be a fool if I believed in a crucified dead Jew. He said, But I believe in the risen living Son of God. Amen. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. And I know that he's living. I don't care what any men say. The resurrect effect. Now from this same text this morning, Paul presents this what if scenario if Christ had not risen. But in this same text here, I'll tell you what else we discover. We discover three proofs of the resurrection. I want to give them to you. Number one. First proof is this, salvation. Verse 1 and 2, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You see, the first two verses are given to the subject of how these Corinthians had been saved. How was it then? that they had been saved. Paul tells us in the next two verses, in verse 3 and 4, he says that Jesus Christ died according to the Scriptures, was buried, and then on the third day, he rose again according to the Scriptures. They had been born again, saved, if you will, through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's three components of the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen to me, their life had been changed and they had been saved. And hear me, if your life hasn't been changed, you ain't been saved. He's a life changer. And here's what I want you to get. A dead Jesus could never change one thing about anybody's life. A dead Jesus could not take the hellish and make it holy. 
A dead Jesus could not take the sinner and make he or she a saint. A dead Jesus could not take a blasphemer and make him or her a believer. Only a living Jesus can regenerate the spirit of man, take up residence in his life, and move him away from sin and toward the virtues of Christian character. No rotting Jesus in a tomb can accomplish such amazing feats of transformation. Our president on Friday declared today Transgender Visibility Day on Easter Sunday. And don't you think it wasn't on purpose that he did it on Easter Sunday? First of all, I just want everybody to know everything's visible to the all-seeing eye of God. Amen? He sees the good and the bad. He sees it all. But I just want to say to you today, today is not about Transgender Day. Today is Transformation Day. Amen? Today is a day about the transforming power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, dear church, I want you to know that he changed my life. How about you? Can I get a witness? Amen? This room is full of people with transformed lives. So which, what do I say to that? He must be alive. <laughs> because a dead man can't change one single fiber of your being. I'm living proof. I was dead in trespasses and sins, but the living Lord brought me to life. I don't know how many of y'all remember this. I think it was about 20 years or so ago that there was a group of people, it was a cult, and they called themselves Heaven's Gate. Do y'all remember this group? Well, they were a cult that followed this guy, and, and that was about the time. Do y'all remember all of, the, you know, all of the, the promotion and all of the media and everything? The Hell Bop Comet was going to pass close enough to earth that you know, you'd be able to see light with the naked eye. And then if you have even had a, an elementary type telescope or whatever that thing's called, um, you'd be able to see monumental things. Well, this, this leader of this cult attached their whole belief system to the passing over of the Hellbop Comet. And the leader led them to believe that when the Hellbop Bop Comet passed, then they would go along with it and leave this world behind. So much so was his influence that he led every member of that cult to commit suicide. And they found all 39 of them dead in one building, lying there with their hands across their chest like that, dressed in black. You may remember this story. Listen to me. Their leader found them alive and left them dead. Jesus finds people dead and leaves them alive. Amen? The preservation of the church for the last 2,000 years is proof of a resurrected Christ and his salvation of millions upon millions. Think of those disciples for just a moment, sniveling cowards at the cross, running and hiding. Would they have risked their life and limb then going forward for a dead Jesus? Man might die for the truth, but he will not die for a lie. You see, it was the resurrected Jesus that transformed them into bold witnesses and preachers for the next few decades, and many of them died. All of them died, in fact, a martyr's death, according to, to tradition. At some point, if Jesus was still in the grave and Peter's about to be crucified upside down, don't you think he says, time out? This whole thing's a sham. I recant. What empowers a man to go from denying him at the cross, just before the cross, after his arrest, to being one of the greatest bold preachers that we see on the day of Pentecost and throughout the book of Acts? I'll tell you what, a risen Savior. Salvation's proof of the resurrection. Number two, so are the Scriptures. The exact phrase that Paul uses here is that he rose again the third day. Echo this with me. According to the Scriptures. Amen. It's a great proof of the resurre resurrection that it should have been no real surprise. that the, the Old Testament had even predicted the resurrection of the coming Messiah. Here's an example. 
It's recorded in Acts chapter 2, verses 25 through 31. Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he quotes Psalm 16. And he comments that David, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ. He identifies Psalm 1610 as a definite, resurre- a definite reference to the resurrection of Jesus. Again, with Acts as our interpretive guide, Paul preaching on this particular occasion in Acts 13, verse 32 and 33, and we declare to you glad tidings. That promise was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, and he's quoting second psalm, verse 7 at this point, I will give you the mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm at this point, again, quoting Psalm 1610, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Predicted in the Old Testament. You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when it says that the Messiah, that the one that would come, to redeem mankind, would bruise his heel, but he would crush the serpent's head. Jesus' suffering and the death on the cross was the bruising of his heel. But when he came forth out of the tomb, he crushed the head of Satan. Amen? Satan plays his ace of spades, which was death, and then Jesus even trumps that. What are you going to do? with a man that just won't stay dead. What proof of his resurrection is any greater than the mere fact that it was predicted thousands of years beforehand that he would be raised from the dead? I'm telling you, no amount of coincidence could ever lead to this monumental historical fact. Salvation's proof of the resurrection. The Scripture's proof of the resurrection, but let me give you an even greater one. Seeing is proof of the resurrection. Seeing is believing, right? And Paul records in our text this morning that many people saw the resurrected Jesus. In verse 5, he says that Peter saw him, but we don't know what particular event that might be referring to. In verse 5, he then says that the twelve saw him. In verse 6, 500 saw him, and all at the same time, by the way. And Paul said that had been 20 years ago, of course, at this point. So Paul says, most of them are still alive. If you don't believe me and what I'm telling you about the resurrection, here's a list of addresses. Why don't you go down there to Elm Street, number 20, and talk to John and talk to Sally. They saw him alive, too. You can go ask them for yourself. Verse 7, he says that James and all the apostles saw him again. And then by Paul himself in verse 8 on the Damascus Road at the time of his conversion. There is nothing more powerful than an eyewitness account to prove anything. What other exclamation can there be for the transforming of of the disciples from sniveling cowards to bold preachers that they became practically overnight? There is no explanation other than the fact that they saw him alive. The resurrection of Christ is the best proved fact in history. John Phillips says this. He says, There is more concrete evidence for the resurrection of Christ than there is for the conquest of Britain by Julius Caesar, and he's right. There's a story told from the pages of history. It's about two young men both of them from London, named Lord Littleton and Gilbert West. And they were both skeptics, skeptics about Christianity. And so out of their, skeptic, out of their skepticism, they, they sought to disprove and destroy Christianity. And they had a great plan, I want to tell you. They determined that the whole of Christianity rested upon two things, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And they thought that if they could undermine these two things, then they would discredit Christianity as a whole. And I want to applaud them and say they're absolutely right. 
If they could discredit the resurrection and the conversion of Paul, Paul, who is the author of the bulk of the New Testament, then indeed the foundation upon which we stand as Christians would crumble. So what they did is they decided they would divide and conquer. West undertook the task to disprove the resurrection and Littleton took on Paul's conversion. So they agreed to separate for a time pursue their studies, assemble their arguments, and then meet up again to put it all together. But what happens next is one of the great, great romances of the faith. Both men, through their attempt to discredit Christianity, were converted to Christ. By the way, that happens all the time. People who are skeptic and and, and cynical, they go out on an earnest academic pursuit to disprove Christ and the resurrection, and they end up coming to know him because once they do an intellectually honest research about the resurrection of Christ, they realize it is irrefutable. Irrefutable. So they come to Christ, they get converted. Not only that, they both then wrote a book to prove the accuracy of the New Testament narrative. In fact, Gilbert West's book on the resurrection was considered a classic in its day. Folks, there's just too much evidence to overturn the verdict. Jesus Christ is alive. Amen? Amen. Well, as I start moving toward a close... We need to be reminded of something this morning. For Jesus to rise from the dead, he first had to be killed. Verse 3 reminds us that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He did this not for his sins because he had none, but for our sins because We're all sinners. Everybody in this room, including this Baptist preacher this morning, is a sinner. Sin is not a disease for all the medical skill in the world has no cure for sin. Sin is not ignorance for all the universities in the world cannot educate us out of sin. The only thing that could be done was done. And that is that Jesus died for our sins. The shoulders of Jesus were like giant altars where the sin of the world was laid upon the Son of God and the heart of Jesus like a giant reservoir where all the putrid and polluted streams of humanity was poured and the wrath of God drained it dry. And that is why we sing Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Listen, if you're not a Christian, then those first six things that I dealt with this morning, that's your life. That's what it's like without Christ. You're hopeless, my dear friend. i got to tell you, i got to be honest with you. Christ's resurrection means nothing to you if he's not your Savior. You have no hope through death. Don't, I urge you, don't go through life pie in the sky and leave your eternity up for chance. Don't do it. In spring of 1665, the great plague of London claimed its first victims. By the time all was said and done, estimates, estimations are somewhere between 75,000 and, and 100,000 or more. That perished in the great... That was one quarter of London's population at that time. We know that the source of the plague were fleas that were on rats. But people thought that it was from polluted air. One of the things they did is that they would join hands in a circle around roses, breathing the fragrance in which they thought gave them good, fresh, clean air to breathe. And this whole occasion gave birth to a nursery rhyme that children sang, but I want you to understand the origin of it's really morbid. There was a man pushing a death cart who would pass by and sing, Ring Around the Rosies, 
pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, you know it, right? We all fall down. Posies were little fragrant flowers. People would put them in their pockets to try to ward off the smell of decaying bodies. Ashes is a reference to the burning of those decaying corpses. And all falling down referred to the fact that they could smell the roses all they wanted, but they were still going to fall in death. You see, dear friend, you too will one day fall in death. And you can join hands and go in a circle and sing all the little songs, cute little songs you want to sing, but the fact is, apart from Jesus Christ, you'll fall in death and you'll stay in death. And you'll just move from the first death to the second death one day when you're eternally separated from God because you didn't receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But, but, Jesus died and rose so that he can pick us up from the grave. So that he can change our eternal destiny. And you can be saved today by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you'll place your faith in him, his finished work on the cross, his death and his resurrection from the dead. Receive him today as the Lord of your life. Repent of your sin. Surrender your life to him and him alone. The resurrect effect. There is an effect. Thank God that there is, amen. But there can still be a resurrected Jesus and you not make it to heaven. Because you see, the Bible requires of us faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Savior.